My name is Shannon Mays. Um, just a little history on the program. Over 20 years ago, um, a couple of our members, Becca Melendez and Chris Hunt, um, saw a need in their schools. Um, and to help that need, they started getting students Christmas gifts. Uh, word got out, the program got really popular, um, and they couldn't handle it themselves. So they reached out to the church, um, and of course, uh, we answered the call. So this is my second year running the program. Um, I helped Jeb and Caitlin for years. Uh, last year, we were able to help 135 individuals in 45 families in five schools. <laughs> um, right at the end of the program last year, I got a call from Vista Peak, um, and they said, hey, we heard you guys do this. Can you help some of our students? And I said, sure. You know, what are you thinking? And they're like, 35 families. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I go, that's about as many as I helped total this year. Um, so I committed to like 10 or 15, but we could be up to over 60 families this year. Um, so that's my goal. Um, so what I need from you guys is obviously donations. Um, I'm trying to raise over $7,000 this year. Um, we like to give each person um, a need item, so like a coat, pair of boots, pillows are really popular. Um, and then we also like to get them something fun, uh, a want item, so a toy, a basketball, art supplies, something that they ask for on the list. Um, if you guys are crazy clearance shoppers like me, I will take any donated items that you've bought throughout the years, or throughout the year. Um, poor Emily, I've taken over one of her closets upstairs um, with just clearing stuff that I've bought throughout the year. I can't pass up dollar blankets and $5 winter coats. Um, it's a little crazy up there. But if you guys have any of those items, I will gladly take them for you. Um, I need gift wrap, um, gift bags really help. Um, gift tags, boxes, all that kind of stuff, I'll gladly take those. Um, Prayers, if we can pray for these families. We do not know their, their situations, yeah. but a lot of times these are the only gifts they're gonna have this year. Um, I will need help with shopping. So the first couple of weeks in December, a bunch of us will get together a few nights and go to Walmart and I pass out the list and we just shop. Uh, they closed on a register for us and we have seven or eight carts of stuff um, and we check out and it, it, it's actually pretty fun. Um, we'll do the wrapping party here on December 15th, uh, right after church. So anyone that can help me with that, uh, lunch will be provided. The Broncos do play that day, so if I can get lots of help, I can get you out of here before 2.30. Um, we did find a job for Ed, by the way. He, uh, he writes out the tags. Lori wraps and he writes the tags. So yes. we found a home for him. <laughs> Um, so if you guys could, you can donate online. Um, there's a drop down, Aurora Public Schools Outreach. You can leave your donation in the back. Just mark it Aurora Public Schools, and I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> Folks, it's a way we make a difference in our city. And all these families, the, the schools know, and they're, they're very poor families. And what a blessing we get to be to these families to just share the love that God has given us with them. Today is also uh, Veterans Sunday. And so I want you to watch this video now. You stood with courage, defending our nation's values. You left your home so we could stay safe. You face dangers for our peace and freedom. You serve with honor, guarding our liberty. You are our protectors, brave and steadfast. Your sacrifices are profound and we are deeply grateful. Thank you, veterans, for your unwavering service. You are our heroes, today and always. Welcome home, veterans.
we're so grateful today and thankful. And I'd like all the vets that are here, if you would please stand. And if you would just stay standing just a minute. Um, if we didn't get your pictures, we're sorry about that. Um, but we'll keep doing it. John's going to come forward, John Carden. And uh, part of what we know is, is you all pay a price and have paid a price. We also know your families do. And so he brought some flowers and we would like each veteran to come and get a flower for their spouse. Um, because we want to recognize the families as well. And so we're grateful. So if, if you guys would come forward and, and get some of these, that would be great. also had these bracelets that we that the veterans were given out and if you didn't get one we want to invite you to get one at the end of the service so thank you so much are you ready to worship yeah. Yeah. there's a song we did called Nadia Como 2 we want to get some energy going so would you stand with us as we sing this song together <clears throat> oh yes we're doing it again, guys. Come on. Jesús 
shout your praise louder and louder, mine's my sweat sing together.
in Christ in Him alone in Christ alone my hope is found He is my life my strength my soul this cornerstone this solid ground filled through the fiercest sound and storm what hangs on the
There is none. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Your mercy. grateful for God's sovereignty in everything. No matter what, how the outcome would have come, we still need to remember our leaders in prayer. And so let's remember them. We also want to remember Sandy Doster and Alan Russell and um, Rick Paulson's daughter. We want to remember her. And then we want to remember a power surge. Clint and all the youth workers that are there. This is their final time together. And then um, we'll be saying goodbye to Clint. This is his last Sunday for with us. We want to pray for him and Aletha as they move forward in, their, in God's direction in his ministry. Let's bow our heads this morning as we pray, as we approach the throne. Father, we're so grateful for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that we didn't have to search long because you reached out across eternity, Lord, two millennia ago, and took upon yourself and sacrificed your life for us. And thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty. We thank you for your direction. We pray for our nation. Father, we pray that you'll give our leaders wisdom we pray father that we will remember them in prayer we pray for Sandy Doster and Rick Paulson's daughter and Alan Russell and we pray Lord you know those situations you know their physical needs and father we ask for your presence to be with them now Lord, we pray for a power surge. It's a district event. There's a couple hundred youth, Lord. I pray for our workers and Clinton. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would rest upon them. Be with them. Strengthen them, Lord. May you just move in their hearts. Jesus, we're so grateful for who you are. We thank you for the transformative life that we can experience when we accept you as, your, as our personal Savior. Father, we don't have to walk alone. We don't have to search eternity. You're right there. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for your sense, the quietness of your spirit this morning pray you'll bless pastor as he brings his series on transform, uh, transforming life. 
Father, just hide him behind the cross. May he just fade into the background. and May we just hear your words through him. We love you. We thank you for your provisions. We thank you, Lord, for the moisture. Not all at once, but we did get quite a bit. And we're grateful for that. And Father, no matter what happens, technically, Lord, you're there. We thank you. We thank you for everything you're doing in our lives, in our families, and in our church. We love you. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen and amen. Well, thank you so much. We're in this series on a transformed life out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. And my hope is those verses will become really familiar with to you before we're done. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and please, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now this morning, I want us to read further in Romans 12 to kind of get a picture and a view of what a transformed life might look like. And so we're going to read the verses, Romans 12, 9 through 21. Are you ready? Let love be fake. Hate everything good and cling to what is evil. Don't give yourself away in love to anyone. Always put yourself above others. Disgrace others. Live apathetically, bowing to nobody. Hope is lost and trials are coming. Remember that you are here to look out for yourself. Never help another in need. Persecute those who persecute you. Don't bless them. Let them rejoice alone. Let them weep alone. This is not worth your time or energy. Live in chaos with one another. Leave the poor alone and remember that you hold all the knowledge. An eye for an eye. Keep yourself and your needs first. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live in conflict with everyone. This is not the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. (laughs) Those words need transformation. Just the reading of that, doesn't it? So Benjamin, I want you to come and I want you to read what God actually said. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual faith fervor (laughs) serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need practice hospitality blessed are those who persecute you bless and do not curse rejoice with those who rejoice be willing to associate with people of low position don't think of your you are superior do not repay anyone evil for evil be careful what to do what is right in the eyes of everyone If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to revenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll be heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Benjamin. Didn't that resonate better with you? 
that, that sure made more sense to me than what I read. I'm so grateful that God came to transform this whole world. You remember our dog, Lacey? Um, did the picture get in there? I had a picture of her yesterday. <laughs> out in the snow. I've talked about her, so I thought, man, I need to, to, to show you a picture of her. Um, I, I need to tell you a little bit about our beginnings. She was a dog that Lori found online. The people who had her, this should have been our first clue, were willing to drive her from the Longmont area clear down to Aurora <laughs> to give her to us. Well, we had to pay a little. But they said, we're willing to bring her, but if you want to give her back, you have to drive her clear back to us. <laughs> that should have been our first clue. When she came to us, she was really nervous. Now, by nature, she's a runner. And so for the, that first week, if the door was open or if the gate was ajar, out the door she ran, and we had to go running after her. We had to make plans that if she got out across the road, some car was going to take her out, and you just need to be ready for that. That was just who she was. When we tried to reach down and pet her, she would look at us and back up and start growling. We finally got to where we could kind of pet her and you know how most dogs love their tummies rubbed and we'd, we'd roll her over and she would start growling at us. And I mean, I was like, what kind of dog did we get? We knew we had some work to do. Can I tell us God has some work to do in our lives? It, it is so true that God loves us and accepts us the way we are. But he doesn't leave this there. He wants to work in our lives. He has beautiful plans and ways in which we can live. And this whole book of Romans, Paul starts this out talking to them about their need for God. And he begins the book, man, without God, life is really difficult. And he begins to lay out all the things that they had been doing. They were trapped in sin and selfishness and people had turned away from God. And humanity stood guilty in front of a righteous God. The Jewish people, as they began to read this, were probably thinking, ooh, look how lucky we are that we're here. Because we're God's chosen people. But then Paul begins to tell them, not, not so fast. You guys were just as sinful and idolatrous as everybody else. And in kind of a nice way, he says to them, you guys had the Torah. You had the law. You should have known better. I'm glad that's not the end of the book. I'm glad it didn't stop there. Because Paul had more to say when he begins to talk about Jesus and how there is freedom in Christ. How there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Jesus came as Israel's Messiah to die for all people as he took upon himself the sins of the cross. And he overcame it all by his resurrection. Jesus became what we are so that we could become like who he is. He came to forgive us and to change and transform our lives. And it doesn't happen just by obeying the law, but by being in Christ. Remember the word transformation means transformed is being, change that comes by being with So I want to talk a little bit about how does this transformation happen in your and my life? The reality is every single one of us has needed, may still need, and probably will need the transforming work of God in our lives. We live in a world that's challenging, that's difficult. We're making decisions every day. 
We're having to deal with people. We're having to deal with situations and circumstances. There's a devil who is still tempting and trying to defeat your life and my life. And this passage in this book isn't a, oh, you better shape up and do better. This passage is a, I have a plan for you. And I've come to help you. This is really positive and good. And the first thing that I want to say about how this happens is, is, is simply, tr- number one, transformation is for you. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. That word urge has the idea of someone saying, hey, come right alongside me. Let me talk to you. I was trying to remember the last time I said the word urge. I urge you. Is that normal conversation? We don't always say that word. But there have been times we've said, let me be clear. (laughs) Do do I have your attention? I want to talk to you. Now, I did that more when I was a parent. There were times I had to say to our kid, uh, let me be frank and clear with you. I had a really good friend growing up in South Dakota. His name was Ernie. And um, he was in trouble and he went to the office and their, their principal's name was Frank. And the guy was just mad at him and, and just going after him. And finally, Ernie said, I'll be earnest with you if you'll be frank with me. <laughs> um, I don't think that helped him. But I'll never forget that story. But when Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, he was being serious about what he was going to say. And he was saying, God wants to speak into your life. This whole transformation, what God wants to do is for you. It's not a institutional church. It's not a program. This is personal to you and to me. And it's not just for believers who who just accept Christ. God wants to continue to transform your and my life. And it'd be easy for me as a pastor to go, man, I need to preach this to the people. As opposed to start off with God. What do you need to transform in my life? What is it today that you need to say to me? I love the openness of this. There's not a condemning of anybody else. It's a folks, let's listen and hear what God wants to say to us. And as I read that different version earlier, I I hope there was within you this, no, that's not good. Because can I tell you, a lot of our world, that's how they live. It becomes obvious that we need transformation in our world. But folks, it doesn't start out there. It starts right here. And Paul was writing to the church. And he said, I urge you, brother. I urge you, sister. In view of of God's mercy. See, secondly, it all started with God. In view of God's mercy, I urge you in view of God's mercy, in light of all that God has done for us. That word for mercy means compassion, this deep feeling about someone else's difficulty, this caring for somebody else. The reality is God actually seriously cares about you. And he cares about everybody else in this world too. It's easy to care for each other when we're in the sanctuary together, we can greet each other. The people that aren't here, God cares about them too. The people that go to church, God cares about them. But the folk that have no church, have no faith, I need to remind us, God cares about them just as much. He he cares about your situation. And all through the Bible, God cared. Way back in Exodus, God even said, I've heard your cry. 
And God is still looking at us. He's still looking at people saying, I hear you. I see your pain and I have compassion for you. I'm moved for you, so moved that God wants to do something in and through your life. Our being transformed into the likeness of God doesn't start with us. It actually starts with God. It starts with his prevenient grace going ahead of us, seeing what it is we need. And I began to think about all that God has done for us. He created us as each one as unique individuals. I I was looking around the room to see if I saw two people that looked the same. (laughs) Can't do it, can you? I mean, Egbert, you're close. Not really. Yeah. Just good looking, huh? Yeah. I mean, every, God created every single one of us unique and beautiful in our own way. I mean, it's amazing that he took the time to knit us together so beautifully and wonderfully. What a mercy of God to create life. God was deeply grieved by the sin of Adam and Eve And he realized that that sin affected all of us. But God had so much love for those he created before we were ever born. He sent Jesus to die for us. God's already been at work ever before we came on the scene. Thank you, God, for your mercies. And he sent Jesus to walk among us so that that he could say with authority to us, he didn't need it, but for our help, I understand what you go through. I experienced the temptation, the pain, the suffering. He willingly went through the suffering for us. I have not suffered like Jesus has suffered. Oh, the mercies of God. And because he was willing, God forgave us. He gave us the free gift of salvation. We don't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But we receive it as a free gift. Isn't that wonderful? That's part of why I love the fact that our church does the Aurora Public School because you see, sometimes you go, well, how do people know God loves them by us just giving them Christmas presents? People that didn't earn it or deserve it from our perspective. We just give. And they get to receive a gift. And it's our prayer that the Holy Spirit, who's always working ahead, that God's mercies will speak into the lives of families going, you know what? There are people that live by a different way and they love in a different way and we didn't earn it or deserve it and they just freely gave us gifts. Isn't that beautiful? So the very nature of what we're doing in this next month, and this last month, all the Operation Christmas Child boxes, same thing. We get to be a part of the mercy giving of God. We don't twist anybody's arm. We don't say, hey, you have to do this. We don't send you a bill in the mail. We just simply, I'll never forget, first year we, I was here and, and Becca Melendez was a part of our church and, and we were talking about this and, 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 and she was, came to me and, hey, we need to do the kickoff for Operation Christmas Child. And, and I said, well, how does it work? She said, well, I just get up and tell them what we need. And I said, that's it? She said, yeah. I said, no big advertising, no big signs. No, no I just get up and tell people. I thought, well, that ain't going to work. And I sometimes like saying this, can I tell you, I was wrong. Because people just began to give. Because here's what I saw. The mercies of God have transformed the lives of people. So that we're not all about ourselves. We don't hate our culture. We actually love people. And when we have opportunities in which we can give and make a difference, when we can serve and make a difference, it just comes flowing out of us. Because that's what God did for us. His mercy, he adopted you into the family. If you're a believer, you're part of this huge family. You are not alone. 
And sometimes in our humanity, we can be so convinced, you know, I'm in this by myself. I don't have any relatives. Can I challenge, look around the room, look at all the relatives you have. We don't often see it that way. We're not the enemy. We're actually brothers and sisters, and Paul kind of makes that clear and obvious. And there's something merciful about knowing that I'm not alone. Oh, this is good. And today, we're placed under grace, not under law. Oh, my goodness. I'm so grateful for the day in which we live. Back in the Old Testament days, you disobeyed God. There was immediate consequences and punishment. But because of the mercy of Jesus, God punished Jesus on our behalf. That is merciful. God did all this before we were ever born. And we need to understand God's transforming work in our life doesn't begin with us. It's for us, but it all started with God. But then transformation happens as I present myself to God. He says, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. To present in, in that language meant to stand beside, to place beside, to be present with God. It's not a forced situation. This is not a demand that God makes on us. Now, Paul's urging us, but he's saying, I just want you to present, to offer yourselves to God. I don't know if you've been in the courtroom lately. I've not. Oh, you ought to be grateful for that. Your pastor's not in trouble with the law. <laughs> but if you've been in the courtroom when the judge walks in, I wish I had that deep bass voice, you know, that could say, all rise. I try to make a microphone and it doesn't help. But there's this, we stand in honor and respect of, correct? Have you ever just sat there and not stood? It probably wouldn't be a good Thing. I'm not sure what the penalty for that is. Um, I don't plan on finding out. <laughs> I was looking around for the people that work in the court system. Maybe they can tell us. And there's kind of this peer pressure. Everybody should just stand. Paul is urging them to present an offer. We need to encourage one another to just offer yourselves to God. Have you ever wondered why we stand in worship? When I was a kid, our worship services, we didn't stand. We sat the whole time. And I thought it was kind of weird. I came to the Kansas City metro area and people stood up. And I thought, sit down, I can't see the words. Because I was sitting. One thing I do like about those days is there were times as we sat in worship, the Holy Spirit would fall on our worship. And before long, somebody stood up and just lifted their hands. And you knew that God's Holy Spirit was ministering to them and speaking to them. And there was something about that standing up that they just wanted to give praise and glory to God. Somewhere as a culture in the churches, we, we kind of figured that out. And so it's kind of typical to stand when we worship, which I honestly think is a good thing. Because it's, it's getting our whole selves involved. It's, it's a little simple step of get your body involved in this. Because in those days, when Paul said, offer your bodies, he was referring to the whole person. And I was reminded as I was studying this, you see, worship isn't about me. It's about God. That's right. Hallelujah. 
It's kind of weird to hear some people say, well, I really enjoyed worship today. Worship is us offering to God. And my question is always, God, did you enjoy our worship? Were you blessed? Were you pleased in the way I offered myself in worship to you? And you see, that's why it's so important for us to understand that worship isn't a Sunday morning singing activity. It's an all of our life activity. And this offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Now, that's an interesting concept. Back in, in the Old Testament days, every animal that was sacrificed, they killed and it was dead. And often in the sacrifices, they burned up the whole animal. And so Paul was getting ready to teach them for something new. You see, God doesn't just want you at the end of your life. God has something for us now. He wants to make some changes and some transformations and do some new things in our life. And he wants to, us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. When the animal's dead, it has no choice whether it's going to be a sacrifice or not. When it's living, it does. And everyone knows probably that when you sacrifice for God, it's not always easy, is it? And sometimes in the midst of the sacrifice, there's pain. It takes dedication. It takes focus. It takes willingness to continue. And here's what's amazing. That whole concept of living sacrifice wasn't thought of by us. We saw it in the life of Jesus. He was the true and living sacrifice. He offered himself to God. And even in the life of Jesus, we see that it was tough. He sweat drops of blood. He even prayed, Father, if there's any way to take this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And for God to transform our lives into the likeness of his son, it begins with you and I offering ourselves, not holding anything back, but saying, God, here I am. And it's saying, number four, God, whatever you want. Whatever you want. And he says that phrase, this is your true and proper worship. Remember when I said worship isn't about us, it's about God. That's one thing God had to do work in my life. For years, I was always critiquing our worship and the songs and how it was played and how it was sung and all those things. And God began to really work in my life quite a few years ago. And this whole concept came out. We, we worship for an audience of one. And it's him. I think we need to encourage each other. I think we need to sing. I think we need to read scripture. I think we need to offer. But it's not about us, it's about God. And it's about saying, God, whatever you want to do in my life. You see, God's ways are different than ours. I'll never forget, we were on a mission trip down in Panama. And we went to a church where they had no musical instrument. We took a group down there and we bought a a, a nice keyboard for their NYC and they were after that event going to give it to the local church because this church had no music of any kind. And their whole worship was just standing and clapping and they just started singing. 
which if we were back in the United States, we'd go, well, this is lame. We get done with that service and my NY president walked out, there were tears in his eyes. And he said, this service was worth the whole cost of this trip. Because it caused us to worship God in a whole new way. And we just offered whatever we had to God. Transformation's not me about me just doing better and getting it next time. It's actually, as you've heard Pastor Marsha talk about in Two weeks ago, it's, it's offering ourselves to God. Again, God doesn't force this on anybody. He will transform any life that is offered to him. And the reason I, I, I selected this picture was because you see on the left, it's, it's dead and it's barren, but God has good plans and fruitful plans for all of our lives. And we don't become Christians just so we can make it to heaven. God has plans for us now while we're still living. And he wants us to offer himself to him. And he actually wants you, and hopefully he wanted you to hear that what I read from from verses 9 through 21 is like, ooh, that's not right. Ooh, I don't like that. That's good. And then when Benjamin read, there was just a, yes, this is how it should be. The other day I was out walking my dog again. And we were walking down the street and remember I told you there was this family where the couple was struggling. So we were walking by the house and the dad was out and his mom was out. And little Leo was out. And so as we began to walk up, Leo started walking down the driveway towards the dog and the grandma didn't know us. And she said, oh, Leo, be careful of the dog. And immediately the dad said, it's okay. He likes Lacey. And Leo walked about halfway down towards the sidewalk and then just veered off into the grass and sat down. Lacey walked up and went and stood right beside him. And I said, Lacey, lay down. And immediately she laid down and Leo sat there petting him, her. I about fell over, can I tell you that? So one of the few times she's really listened and obeyed. I was kind of thrilled, Rich. You've trained a lot of dogs. The grandma just stood there and her mouth was just kind of wide open. There's her grandson in this strange dog to her, just sat there. And, and I had to admit and acknowledge maybe that dog's learning something. Not all the time. Can I tell you, God doesn't want to make us do anything, but he wants as we offer ourselves to him, He can work in and through our lives in such beautiful ways to make a difference. And I thought about this story and I thought, if if Lori and Robin and I can help try and train this dog and it'll actually learn to do some good things, what could God do in and through our lives? A people of self-will who come to God and offer ourselves as living sacrifices to him. starts with us saying God I offer myself to you now today you might be new to the faith maybe you're not a believer and the first step is just saying God I give you myself forgive me and come into my life I need to receive that love of God into my life There may be people that you've accepted Jesus, but it's still kind of been you do what you want to do, kind of like my dog. And God's saying, I have so much more that I can do in and through your life. I have ways in which you can live that are beyond even what you can ask or imagine today. I can help you. 
and I can create in you a picture of Jesus that people can see in this world. And this morning, God may be speaking to you. Maybe you've done that and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but as we live, sometimes we gotta go, oh, Jesus, I need you to continue to work on me because we live in a fallen world. So I want you to stand with me. And uh, we're going to sing that chorus one more time. There is none like you. Maybe you want to come and kneel at these altars or stand in front of these altars. And, and maybe you're like, you know what? I need to just get right with Jesus. I'm not a believer. I've not given my life to him. And, and I need to do that. And maybe you can do it right there where, you're, where you stand. But along with Paul, he says, I urge you, therefore, to offer your bodies. And sometimes taking that physical step helps us in our minds to understand, you know what, I'm serious about this. I'm gonna give myself to God. Maybe God's been talking to you about an area of your life that you've not surrendered to him. And he's saying, I wanna come right alongside you. And I wanna change this in your life. Maybe it's something that you've been struggling with that you've been saying, man, I'm just gonna try and do better. And God's saying, you don't have to try and do better. You let me come in. You let me walk alongside you and I'll help you with this. Jesus, as we come to this time, I, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to our hearts, that you would be the one that would urge us, that would draw us to a closer different walk with you. As we sing, if, if, if you would like to come, we just invite you. There is none like you. to speak into our hearts and into our lives? Would you continue to transform us into the likeness of your son as we offer ourselves to you? And there may be situations this week that as we walk through it, we may go, oh God, you still have work to do in my life, don't you? I'm so grateful that you sent your Holy Spirit to walk among us, to fill us, and to help us live for you every day. God, we wanna, we wanna help transform Aurora. And we don't wanna keep you here. We want you to go out through the lives of people in this church all over this city. And so God, thank you for what you're saying and speaking into our lives today. Thank you for this opportunity of worship. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. As we come to close, one's praying. Um, we have cake in honor of our veterans today. And so we, you are dismissed. We also have Sunday school classes that'll happen at 11. And they're listed in the bulletin. If you're not a part of a, a small group of people, we invite you to check that out. God bless you. You are dismissed. Well, I'm so glad that you joined us today on this beautiful Sunday in Colorado. The morning started off pretty chilly, icy roads and sidewalks, but what a beautiful day with the sun out. And you know, um, 
God has beautiful things planned for our lives. He loves us and accepts us the way we are, but then he wants to transform us into the likeness of his son, Jesus. God has incredible things in store for your life, but we have to allow him to change us. Um, this world is not all there is. Aren't you thankful for that? <clears throat> and in that opening, you know, I read the opposite, actually, of what the scripture says. And I hope that created some disequilibrium for you and going, wait a minute, what? No, it shouldn't be that way. And we look at our world kind of with that same, man, it shouldn't be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. Folks, that's an indicator that God has work to do in our lives and in the world around us. And how it happens is as we present ourselves to God in view of his mercy, we offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. God, use me and my life now. Work in and through me in our culture, in our city, in our church, in our families. And so I'm so grateful that you joined us. I'm praying for you today, and if you have prayer requests, please send those in to Pastor Tim, and he'll pass those along, and we'll be praying for you. Thank you for your continued support of our church, and um, we're in this together. So God bless you today, and we'll see you next week.